In fact, I'm a little bit like Josephine Baker. J'ai deux amours. One is independent components analysis. Another one is COMDIM, which lots of people here are going to be talk about, talking about later. Uh, so, first of all, thanks the organisers for inviting me uh, to replace somebody. I'm, I'm happy. Um, okay, so I'll talk about independent components analysis. Some of you may know this technique already because it's becoming quite popular now. There are more and more publications in chemometrics using this technique. What I want to do is not explain all the mathematical details, but to convince you that PCA is all right, but that's all. So, we all know that the starting point of multivariate data analysis is a matrix where you've got variables and uh, in columns and, and your samples, your individuals in rows, and you sort of visualize this. This was the way it was invented more than 100 years ago. You visualize each individual as being a point in the space defined by the columns, the variables. And so uh, this was presented by Pearson in 1901, so it's even older than the uh, special theory of relativity. So this is an old-fashioned old technique. But it's a brilliant idea. The brilliant idea is because if you've just got noise in your matrix, you're just going to have a spherical blob of dots in this multivariate space. On the other hand, if you don't have a spherical blob, maybe you've got something other than noise. And so what you do is you search for the directions of dispersions of the individuals in that space. And these directions are probably interesting directions. And so that's principal components analysis. You look for these directions of dispersion. That's one way of analyzing data. There's another way of analyzing data that uh, I think is brilliant as well. It's the idea of looking without knowing anything for the source signals hidden within your data. In this situation, you don't have the variables as directions in space. What you have is each line is a mixed observed signal containing source signals that you don't know in proportions that you don't know, but you want to know them. And so what you're going to do is try and decompose each line in the matrix into a series of uh, source signals with the corresponding proportions. So principal components analysis looks as, at the data matrix as points in multivariate space. Independent components analysis looks at it as a set of, of observed signals. And so you have something, uh, and I imagine I push on the little button there. Yes. So you imagine you have a matrix here which is composed of a series of unknown signals in unknown proportions that you can represent in this way here. And so you're going to look for the signals and the, the proportions. Here's an example. There you have the source signals that you don't know, and here you have your observed signals. And what you want to do is extract these source signals and the corresponding proportions. In a way, the source signals are a bit like loadings, but they're not loadings, and the proportions are a bit like scores. Now, how do you do this? Um, in the same way that you've got hypotheses that make PCA work, here you've got hypotheses that allow you to do it. The hypothesis, which isn't ridiculous, is that source signals have nothing in common. So all you're going to try and do is extract signals that are independent, that have no link between among themselves. Now, <clears throat> a source signal, its intensities are going to have a certain distribution, a certain uh, uh, histogram of values. If you mix together source signals, the histogram will become more Gaussian because it's a mixture, the central limit theorem. So what you're going to do to try and extract your source signals is uh, rotate them so that their histogram becomes as little Gaussian as possible. So non-Gaussian is the way you're going to determine your independence. Here's an example. We've got the two uh, histograms here. These are histograms of source signals. And you can see that they're not very Gaussian, but if you just sum the two and do the sum the two signals and do the histogram of the signal, the resulting mixed signal, you've got something which is more Gaussian. There are different ways of measuring Gaussianity. Uh, one that everybody knows is the kurtosis, which you see here, it's a fourth moment. But there are other ways of measuring Gaussianity. So ICA is going to be a decomposition of a set of vectors into linear components that are as independent as possible. And then you have to think about what independent really is. Independence more than just not correlated. Here I plotted using Excel. Uh, X squared is a function of X. 
<laughs> it still tells me that the correlation coefficient is equal to zero, but it's obvious that the two are not independent because independence is related through this. The correlation between any power of one and any power of the other has to be uh, equal to zero. And in this case here, if one power is two and the other is one, then you've got a correlation of one. So these two signals in a, uh, between quotation marks are not independent. So ICA tries to extract the original signals, the source signals. Uh, it does this by calculating higher order uh, statistics, such as kurtosis. And uh, it does it based on the um, histogram. PCA doesn't look for that. And PCA doesn't find it. The trouble is, people spend their lives, I've noticed this, looking at their loadings and interpreting their loadings. This is not a good idea, because your loadings are mixtures. Uh, PCA doesn't look for the direction, uh, looks for directions of dispersion of the individuals. It doesn't look for the source signals. Because it doesn't look for them, it doesn't find them. Here's an example. This is some simulated data. I got six signals, rectangular signals with two different frequencies, triangular signals with two different frequencies, two sinusoids with different fre frequencies. I generated 100 sets of six coefficients to sum these signals together and then add a little bit of Gaussian noise. So I've got to end up with a matrix which contains 100 lines and uh, I think there was about... Uh, 800 points or 600 points corresponding to these signals. And this is what the matrix looks like. This is all the mixture of all the different mixed signals. If I look at the histograms of my source signals, you can see they're not at all Gaussian. Uh, this one here is typical of a sinusoidal signal where the, the intensity, there are more intensities at the top and the bottom than in the middle, which explains that distribution there. But if you look at the histogram of the mixtures, well, it's Gaussian. So if you want to extract your pure signals, your source signals, from the, the mixtures here, what you have to do is try and generate non-Gaussian histograms. This is what the initial matrix looks like. I just got nine rows out of the matrix. And so you can vaguely see these different shapes, the triangular or the Gaussian, uh, the sinusoidal signals in there. And here you've got the corresponding histograms. If I do PCA, which is what lots of people like to do, the only good news you have there is that uh, six of the loadings are a little bit structured. The last three are just Gaussian noise. So at least it's worked out how many pure signals are in there. It hasn't extracted the pure signals, but it's got the correct number of uh, You can see here that these are still mixtures of the pure signals. And when you look at the histograms, they're more or less Gaussian, especially the last three, which is vertical. Now, when I do ICA, I get this. I think ICA works well. This I can interpret. These look like my initial signals. If I interpret that, I don't know what I could say, really. Whereas if I look at this, I can start talking about the nature of the phenomena that are happening within my data set. And you can see here the histograms that uh, correspond. So ICA is what I want to do to my data. This is the way I want to treat my data. How do you do it? Well, what you have to do is calculate an unmixing matrix, a matrix that's going to take the mixture of signals and unmix them. So the unmixing matrix, W, is a little bit like the, the inverse of A, the proportions. There are a few problems with ICA. One of the problems with ICA is that there are lots of different ways of doing the calculation, lots of different algorithms. Uh, there's one that lots of people use called Fast ICA. The good thing about Fast ICA is the name. Uh, everybody thinks it goes quickly. Uh, there's a much better method, which is I use all the time now, called J, um, which mathematically uh, is robust like PCA. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. The, the best thing about Jade is it gives me the results I want. So Jade was developed by Cardozo and Sulumiak uh, in 93. It's a technique which is based on the construction of a, a hypercube of cumulants, fourth order cumulants. I'm a chemometrician, I'm not a statistician. I'd never heard of cumulants until I discovered Jade. Uh, but then, like Monsieur Jordan, or Jordan, I discovered I'd been using cumulants without knowing it. 
uh, for example, a second order autocumulant is the variance. Fourth order autocumulant is the kurtosis. And uh, you can have autocumulants or cross cumulants. And these are what are used to do the calculations with J. So cumulants, you can construct a tensor, a uh, four way tensor out of it. It's sort of a, gen a tensor being a generalization of matrices, cumulants being a generalization of covariance matrices. That means that you're going to have something which is a bit like a matrix, a variance covariance matrix that you decompose in PCA. Here you'll have a cumulant tensor that you're going to decompose in ICA. And uh, what's nice is it's very similar because you're going to diagonalize the cube of cumulants and uh, uh, you'll have none cross cumulants. So the cumulant between two different signals is going to be, you're going to try and make it equal to zero and you're going to try and maximize the cumulant between a signal and itself. So PCA, eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix. ICA with the method, Jade method is diagonalization of a fourth order cumulant uh, tensor. Um, I won't go into all the details of the calculations. That's just the way you calculate a fourth order cumulant from three observed signals. Uh, when you do that, you have autocumulants because there are three signals, you have three autocumulants. And then you have even cross cumulants and odd cross cumulants. And the final formula in each case re resembles that. So you see here you have particular values, and these you put in your tensor. The procedure of Jade is presented here. It can be de decomposed into five different steps. You've got one step which is called whitening to eliminate the variability because you're not interested in variability. You don't want to have your result influenced by the dispersion of the individuals. Uh, you then get a small matrix of loadings, whitened loadings, like a bit like from a PCA. And from this subset, this sort of small set of vectors, here you start off with maybe 100, 200, 20,000 uh, signals. Here you bring it down to maybe 10 or 15. From these 10 or 15 signals, you calculate your fourth order tensor of uh, cumulants. You project that onto <coughs> eigen matrices, or uh, orthogonal eigen matrices, that you diagonalize simultaneously, so joint approximate diagonalization of eigen matrices. And the rotation matrix that allows you to do the diagonalization, you apply it to the whitened, uh, whitening matrix that you calculated up here, and that gives you the demixing matrix. The mixing matrix, you apply to X, your original matrix, that gives you your pure signal. Once you've got the pure signals, you can calculate the mixing matrix, the proportions. So it's in a series of small steps. The calculations are very rapid. The mathematics is uh, very simple. It doesn't take any time whatsoever to do these different steps. And when you get to the end, you've got, uh, you've got your proportions and your uh, source signals. This is uh, the, the matrix I was talking to you about a while ago, the simulator bomb with the triangular and rectangular signals. So I've got 800 points in each signal, and there are 100 uh, mixtures. The whitening step brings it down. I chose to extract eight vectors from this. And so these are like loadings from a PCA uh, with the uh, weighting to make all the directions in the multivariate space equivalent. And then I inject this into the calculation of the cumulants, et cetera. So these are, this is a representation of my four-way cumulant tensor. So you can imagine the first row gives you a cube, and then the other rows afterwards gives you the fourth dimension. So you can see that this is not diagonalized because you've got non-zero values off the diagonal. These matrices, this tensor, you project onto these orthogonal eigenmatrices here, which gives you this. And this is the set of matrices that you're going to diagonalize using classical algorithms. And that gives you this diagonalized matrix. The rotation that was done there is what allows you to calculate your, uh, your signals. Um, what I want to show you now is how this can be interesting. I'll show you some examples using classical signals like spectra and chromatograms, also with multi-way data, because 
you all know you can't apply PCA to an unfolded multi-way data set because it just gives you rubbish in the end. That's why people use Parafact and techniques like that. But ICA can work because ICA uh, works on the histograms. And if it's a histogram that's resulting from unfolding a cube or not, it's still a histogram. And so ICA can work on unfolded multi-way data, like fluorescent signals or hyperspectral images, etc. And I'll show you as well that you can use it on things that you wouldn't consider as a signal. So this is an example of a data set I used to use for years and years to tell my students how wonderful PCA was. I now use, to use it to show that PCA is rubbish and ICA is wonderful. This is a set of 100 spectra of a single polystyrene strip. Uh, they were acquired by Richard Sprague from Perkinoma, I think, at the end of a, um, a factory where they were manufacturing spectrometers. So in fact, each signal corresponds to a spectrometer. And so there are uh, 100 spectra between 4,400 centimeters minus one with a resolution of one centimeter minus one. And when you apply PCA, for example, with PC2, you get this signal, this is water vapor, this is CO2, and this is CO2. So one PC contains two phenomena. This is PC5. Here, it's a little complicated to explain, but you've got sort of beats, and you've got a first derivative effect. That's PC5, and that's PC6. And so two principal components contain the same phenomena. So you're not having any separation out of the phenomena. They're mixed together in the PCs. And this is because you've got one of the spectrometers, which is badly calibrated, and also you've got changes in the thickness of the polystyrene film due to uh, temperature or the position or something like that. And when you plot PC5 against PC6, you can see the spectrometer in 61 was badly adjusted. What's good there is that the difference in frequency between this instrument and all the others is less than one centimeter, centimeter minus one. So PCA is pretty good. It can actually detect something which is below the spectral resolution that was used. So PCA can be good, but you've got this problem of mixtures. So what happens when you use ICA? When you use ICA, you've got water vapor. You've got CO2. You've got the change in thickness of the polystyrene. And you've got the first derivative effect due to spectrometer 61. You separate out your phenomena. You not, don't have things mixed up together. It makes life much easier for interpretation. This is an example of a study done by a, a Russian colleague um, where she wanted to uh, find models to discriminate different types of rice. And so she had these NMR spectra, a whole lot of NMR spectra. That was one of the spectra that she had. I think that's... Uh, uh, aqueous extracts of rice, basmati and non-basmati rice. And uh, she applied ICA and PCA to the data. And what you can see, in red, you've got the PCA. And so you can sort of see they're pretty rubbishy things. They don't look anything like NMR spectra. Whereas the black ones, these are the IC signals, the source signals. And these look like NMR spectra. So that's nice. But what's nicer is that she compared the results she got Using these uh, uh, methods, she compared uh, PCA and then <coughs> LDA, FDA, PLSDA, and ICA on these data to uh, classify the samples. And so she had the, uh, I think I wrote it down there. Yeah, she had a calibration set with 18 basmati, 18 non basmati, and six round, and then a test set. She did cross validation on these ones here to determine the models for PLSDA, et cetera, and uh, tested it independently with these samples here. And these were the results she got. Now, she was happy with that because she got good prediction results with ICA, but she was a bit disappointed that it didn't work as well in some situations as uh, PLSDA, for example. It didn't work quite as well here. Uh, it was no better here. What you have to remember here is that there is only one method there that is not oriented. These three methods here, you tell the machine what the groups are. ICA, you don't tell the machine. The program just extracted out the source signals in the different NMR signals and 
gave you proportions that were characteristic of the different groups of, of rights. This is a non-oriented method, non-supervised method. And so ICA can, in some situations, actually be used as a non-supervised discriminative analysis method. Here's an example of using ICA to analyze uh, hyperspectral Raman images. This is a multi-way data, but uh, a multi-way where you're unfolding the individuals, that is the pixels. So this was work that was done by uh, Mathieu Boiré from Servia Technologies. Um, so a Raman spectrometer connected to a microscope. Initially, there were spectra of between 3,200 and 200 centimeters minus one, and there were 26,000 spectra initially, but he reduced the size a little bit to uh, a little region of interest of 60 by 60 pixels and 801 uh, wave, wave numbers. So that's what the, the spectra looked like. <coughs> Introduced the spectra into ICA, extracted three independent components. This is independent component number one. And here he got the 3,600 uh, proportions, folded it back into a 60 by 60 matrix. And so here you've got the distribution of the compound that produces this spectrum. So you can see the regions where you've got a lot and the regions where you have not much. Here you have just a few little pixels around here corresponding to this uh, compound. And here you have uh, the high concentration areas for this compound here. So that's nice. You sort of see the dispersion, uh, distribution of the compounds. But that's not all. You get this signal. You inject it into the database. And you look for spectra that look like uh, these signals. And so we extracted, he couldn't give us the name, an active principle number one with a coefficient, a correlation coefficient of 0.98 with the first source signal. So we identified the compound. Here, a correlation coefficient for an excipient, which is much lower. The thing is that the spectrum that's in the data set is, in my opinion, not as good as the extracted source signal. Because this is just one spectrum. And it's, uh, in fact, it's avicel, which is a compound that's used uh, often as an excipient and which has different crystalline forms, different hydration forms, etc. So the particular spectrum in the database is just one variant of a whole range of potential spectra for avicel. Whereas this uh, blue signal, which is the signal we're extracting, is taking into account the contributions of lots of different crystalline and hydrated forms of avicel. And so this blue one is probably a better representation of the general population of avicel spectra. But uh, still, it's quite obvious it is this compound. And that's the last uh, excipient where you have a correlation of 0.97. So not only can you have nice signals, not only can you have distributions of the samples, but you can also identify the compounds. He actually used this as well to verify that what looked like a counterfeit pill was actually a counterfeit pill, and that the compounds that were present, present in the pill had nothing to do with what it was labeled as being. So uh, it can be interesting for uh, uh, controlling quality and authenticity of compounds. Another type of multi-way data is uh, what you have when you have LC mass or LGC mass or 3D fluorescent. Here we've got excitation and emission uh, frequencies of uh, 3D fluorescent spectra. These are two different olive oils. You've got uh, Rayleigh scattering here, which is a big problem using classical methods of decomposition of this sort of data. Parafac, for example, cannot handle uh, Rayleigh scattering or Raman scattering. <laughs> what we're interested in is getting the tocopherols, for example, the oxidation products and the chlorophyll <laughs> out of a whole set of these sort of spectra. You can't unfold and then do PCA. That's not acceptable. Parafac has problems with these uh, artifacts. But ICA can do it really well. So um, we've got a cube of data. You can look at the individual spectra, or you can look at the excitation uh, profiles or the emission profiles, or you can unfold the data and then apply ICA and then refold the signals. And uh, so that's what the unfolded data looks like. And when you apply ICA, first independent component is the Rayleigh scattering and the Raman scattering. And so you could just eliminate this from your data matrix. But why, uh, and then treat the purified matrix, the cleaned up matrix, 
treat it with paraffin. But that's a silly idea because you can just use ICA. The second component gives you the tocopherols, mainly. The third one here gives you mainly the chlorophyll with a little bit of the oxidation products. And so you're extracting out each uh, component present in these different spectra. These results, I've compared the signals extracted by ICA with the signals you get with Parafact, and they're very comparable. And I, I feel that ICA is easier to use, easier to determine the number of uh, different signals that are present in the data. Now, <clears throat> ICA can often be used as a means of doing discriminative analysis, but not always. Um, so we fiddled with the program a little bit. This is some data one of our thesis students is working on. Uh, it's the influence of exposure to different pesticides on uh, uh, the urine of farmers. We didn't spray the farmers. It's just that the farmers, they use the pesticides. And so we asked them to piss in the tube before and after uh, spraying their fields. And we knew what <coughs> insecticides or pesticides they were exposed to. And so we have um, the, here the T, that is the control, the Temwa. Uh, here we've got some blanks. Here we've got some quality controls, two types of quality controls. And then we've got two different uh, pesticides here. And so we got this, uh, this is high resolution uh, mass spectra uh, with tens of thousands of peaks. And we applied ICA and we sort of got the beginning of a separation between the samples, but uh, we didn't think it was very good. And we we're wondering whether in fact uh, we'd have better results if we oriented the extraction of the signals. And so what we did is we took the matrix of the mass spectra and we concatenated onto it binary uh, coded group membership matrix. So we had the quality controls, the blanks, the uh, 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 controls, and then the uh, different exposed uh, groups. We stuck the two together. We weighted this a little bit, multiplied by a factor, so that it was about the same scale as, as the spectra, the intensity in the spectra. And then we applied ICA. The interest here is that the second part there, the group part, is going to be part of the signal. And so it's going to be extracted as part of the signal. And this is going to influence, orient the extraction of the signals from the mass spectra. And so this is the mass spectral part. This is the part corresponding to the group matrix for two of the ICs. And you can see that the, this one here separates the uh, controls from all the others. This one here, one of the contaminants from all the others. Um, but it's quite obvious that these proportions here are calculated from the mass spectra, but also from the group matrix. And so it's, being, it's biased. We're sort of cheating a little bit there because we've used this part here as well. So we've oriented it a little bit too much. So what we did is we recalculated the proportions using just this part here. And in that case, we still get a separation of these individuals, the controls, and a slight separation of these individuals, the ones exposed to one of the pesticides, from the others. Now, that's nice. We had about five different components like that, and by having 3D representations, you could see that you could actually separate out the packets of, of individuals fairly well. But still, maybe we're being over-optimistic and we're extracting, uh, biasing the extraction. So what we did is we put into the process a permutation of the group membership matrix and just had uh, 999 different arrangements of the group memberships to see if we could generate models that worked as well as the model with the true group membership. And we couldn't. These are all the uh, F values associated with the Wilkes Lambda uh, for all the 999 random group membership matrices. And this is the value we had for the true group uh, membership. So which this would imply that we cannot extract signals that allow us to predict random groups. Whereas we can extract a signal 
groups that allow us to predict the true groups. So uh, we started doing quite a bit of that now, uh, sort of concatenating signals. We we're also doing it between different types of signals like near infrared and near mid infrared. We stick them together and we apply ICA, which will allow us to find what signals are in common between the different domains. NMR and infrared, for example, uh, could be interesting as well. Now, this is a thing. In fact, I hesitated to do the calculation because I thought maybe it would turn out the wrong way. But I had the impression that since ICA is based on histograms, you don't have to really have a signal. So to test the idea, I got the infrared spectra we had a while ago, and I just randomized the variables. I got a, a random vector, stuck it on there, sorted the random vector and all the matrix, matrix and so all the points in the different uh, spectra, in my 100 spectra, all the points were just reorganized in a random way. You see what I mean there? Good. And I applied ICA to that and to that. And what is interesting is this is uh, one of the signals that's, uh, I don't know, IC3 or something like that, uh, applied on the original data matrix. This is the signal on the randomized data matrix. And this is what I get when I put the variables back in the right order. So during ICA, the variables were randomly organized, but it still extracted the same signal. Is, is that clear? Because it sort of doesn't seem intuitive. Yeah? OK. And so here, this is another uh, IC. That's applied to the original data matrix with the variables structured like a signal. This is what happens when it's whoop, no. this is what happens when it's uh, randomized, and this is what, what it looks like. Well, I'll put it back into the correct order. Like, I did this because I wanted to show that you don't have to have a thing that looks like an infrared spectrum. You don't have to have a thing that looks like an NMR spectrum. It can be just any data, because what you're extracting is not. Uh, nice smooth signals, you're extracting uh, source signals that characterize phenomena, and these source signals have histograms that are non-Gaussian. That means you can apply it to anything. Here are two other examples there. You can apply it to anything. So what we have done is we'd, we've applied it to sensory data and wet chemistry data. You can just consider this as a signal based on uh, acidity, uh, pH, things like that. And here, uh, a signal based on people tasting it and deciding it's sweet or whatever. And so we had a matrix containing uh, about 25, uh, 25 points in the signal, in each signal. And we applied ICA, and then we plotted the results. We applied PCA as well. And so here in red, this is the PCA loading side, in red, we've got the um, analytical variables. And in blue, we've got the sensory. And so you can see here, total acid, total acid and acidity correlated. Huh? And in opposition to pH, which is logical. And then you've got other characteristics, sensory or analytical, that are associated in a particular way. That's nice. Uh, all I want to show, I don't want to show that this is better. I just want to show that you can do it by ICA as well. And the results you get may be, I don't know sensory analysis well enough to say it's true, but uh, maybe the relationship between the variables that you have here is more informative than there, but it's, it's certainly not worse than here. So my message is that ICA is really good, and if you're doing PCA, maybe you should do ICA. Uh, here's another set of uh, another plot, IC3 and IC4, PC3, PC4. So the advantages of ICA, the extracted vectors or source signals have physicochemical meaning, okay, because this corresponds to the sources that you're trying to extract. You can apply ICA to any kind of signals, including multi-way data that you just unfold, analyze, and refold. And what's really nice, and we've seen this many, many times, the proportions that you were calculating are proportional. And if they're proportional, they're really good for doing regression. There are some situations where we get 
one of the vectors of proportions, and we do a sim simple linear regression between that and the characteristic we want to predict. You don't have to do PLS or PCR. You just take one of the loading, uh, one of the, the scores of ICA to do your prediction because it's proportional to the quantity of the signal. You can also use it for discriminative analysis in many cases because you can sometimes have within a group one signal that is characteristic of this group that you don't find in the other groups, which means that you're going to separate out that group of individuals from all the others based on that uh, independent uh, component. But there are difficulties with ICA. Um, different algorithms give different results. So do like me, find an algorithm that gives you the results you like and just use that one. Um, a little more delicate is the problem that in PCA, the components are extracted in a logical way. Uh, you go for the direction of greatest dispersion and then you get the second one, greatest dispersion, rest, uh, remaining dispersion, orthogonal to the first one, etc. which means that you can sort your, logically, it's the logical thing to do, you sort your components based on the variance being extracted. In ICA, you're extracting signals. One signal is no better or worse than another signal. They're all equivalent. And so there's no real hierarchy in your ICs. And uh, that's the first thing. It, you, if you have a matrix and uh, there are a couple of individuals more or less, your ICs may change order. When you extract from a data set, you might have a, ICs one, two, and three. The same data set with a couple of extra individuals, you might have one, two, four, and you have to go an IC further to get the one that was third. Um, and also, it's difficult to determine the number of ICs. You have to have a way of doing it because you can't just base it on variance because you've eliminated that. Um, and if you choose the wrong number, that can modify the results and that can create uh, difficulties in interpreting. You might, if you look for too many, you might start introducing noise. If you don't introduce enough, you may extract mixed signals instead of uh, true independent components. So, PCA doesn't look for and usually doesn't find components with direct physical chemical meaning. You spend hours trying to understand what the different peaks mean. Uh, whereas ICA does, it tries to, and it very often does. Um, you can apply it to all types of data, including multi-way data, and that's one of the really nice things about ICA. And as well, what's good is that it's only just starting now, so if you want to have some easy publications, you can do ICA, and it's much easier to publish than if you do another PLSDA. Uh, we had a paper published in Track a couple of years ago presenting the Jade algorithm. Uh, it took us a couple of years to realize that there were some typing errors in it. And so we got a second publication and improved our H index uh, where we indicated the errors in the first one. Thank you. If anybody wants to try ICA, I've got a toolbox. It's not very well structured. It's not like Cezier, but uh, I can always give you a link to download the functions and give things a try. Yeah, yeah, for me, the, <coughs> the series of values uh, result from a phenomena, phenomena in the sample and also in the mouth of the person who's doing the tasting. This uh, corresponds to something that's intrinsic to the instrument, the mouth, and to the, the sample. And uh, 
there are going to be variations in the values for these different variables, which characterize the sample and the, so very much. And the instrument. And so although it doesn't look like a chromatogram or an infrared spectrum, for me it corresponds to phenomena, and these values are going to be modified by uh, characteristics, etc. And uh, the distribution of the values is going to give you a histogram, which uh, is Gaussian when the phenomena are mixed together, and non-Gaussian when they're separated out. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this uh, graphical display here, would you interpret the variables, the position of the variables in terms of correlation? I, I don't I su suppose to. I mean, I, as in terms of correlations between the variables, is that how you would uh, interpret the directions of the variables? Uh, I, in fact, I rarely do two d plots in PCA or ICA. I usually do just one d plots where I've got the variables here and then I've got the values. Uh, mainly because I have signals, so I have the wave number here and then the, the loading. Um, and so even here, I would more likely have PC1 and then the intensities are, of the loadings on PC1. But uh, I know that uh, very often people like to have this sort of representation, so I did it with PCA and then I showed the similarity with uh, ICA. Um, I can't see why uh, I wouldn't use the same sort of uh, methodology of interpretation in ICA as in PCA. The, the signals we're extracting are not just um, uh, orthogonal, they're independent. And so I think one can apply the same ideas of correlation between variables here mm. as, uh, as here. The other question I had is uh, regarding uh, the fact that if uh, ICA is so efficient as you uh, showed us actually, we're convinced by your, your uh, ICA, why is it not as popular as uh, PCA? I mean, uh, and I probably answered this question because uh, there are difficulties actually in choosing the number, possibly mm. choosing the number of components. I think the first uh, reason is right at the beginning of my presentation there, which is, People have had 100 years to catch on to PCA. And uh, I think now they've caught on to it. Whereas with uh, ICA, it's only 30 years, something like that. Mm. And so, uh, and initially it was a method that had absolutely nothing to do with uh, chemometrics or things like that, or even statistics. It was more uh, for um, eliminate, eliminating artifacts in, in um, electroencephalographs or or uh, images, satellite images, or uh, uh, signals, telecommunication signals. So it was something that was for analyzing signals in a sort of uh, telecommunication sense. And it's only recently that people have started trying to use it to analyze data like a, like a multivariate data analysis method. And there is this problem of how many to extract. 